And this phantom, though in the popular superstition it is held to be the soul of the departed, must not be confounded with the true soul, it is but idolon of the dead form. Hence, like the best attested stories of ghosts or spirits, the thing that most strikes us is the absence of what we hold to be soul, that is, of superior emancipated intelligence. These apparitions come for little or no object, they seldom speak when they do come, if they speak, they utter no ideas above those of an ordinary person on earth. American spirit seers have published volumes of communications in prose and verse, which they assert to be given in the names of the most illustrious dead, Shakespeare, Bacon, heaven knows whom. Those communications, taking the best, are certainly not a whit of higher order than would be communications from living persons of fair talent and education, they are wondrously inferior to what Bacon, Shakespeare, and Plato said and wrote when on earth. Nor, what is more noticeable, do they ever contain an idea that was not on the earth before. Wonderful, therefore, as such phenomena may be, granting them to be truthful, I see much that philosophy may question, nothing that it is incumbent on philosophy to deny, viz., nothing supernatural. They are but ideas conveyed somehow or other, we have not yet discovered the means, from one mortal brain to another. Whether, in so doing, tables walk of their own accord, or fiend-like shapes appear in a magic circle, or bodiless hands rise and remove material objects, or a thing of darkness, such as presented itself to me, frees our blood, still am I persuaded that these are but agencies conveyed, as if by electric wires, to my own brain from the brain of another. In some constitutions there is a natural chemistry, and these constitutions may produce chemic wonders, in others a natural fluid, call it electricity, and these may produce electric wonders. But the wonders differ from normal science in this, they are alike objectless, purposeless, puerile, frivolous. They lead on to no grand results, and therefore the world does not heed, and true sages have not cultivated them. But sure I am, that of all I saw or heard, a man, human as myself, was the remote originator, and I believe unconsciously to himself as to the exact effects produced, for this reason, no two persons, you say, have ever told you that they experienced exactly the same thing. Well, observe, no two persons ever experience exactly the same dream. If this were an ordinary imposture, the Machinery would be arranged for results that would but little vary, if it were a supernatural agency permitted by the Almighty, it would surely be for some definite end. These phenomena belong to neither class, my persuasion is, that they originate in some brain now far distant, that that brain had no distinct volition in anything that occurred, that what does occur reflects but its devious, motley, ever-shifting, half-formed thoughts, in short, that it has been but the dreams of such a brain put into action and invested with a semi-substance. That this brain is of immense power, that it can set matter into movement, that it is malignant and destructive, I believe, some material force must have killed my dog, the same force might, for aught I know, have sufficed to kill myself, had I been as subjugated by terror as the dog, had my intellect or my spirit given me no countervailing resistance in my will. It killed your dog. That is fearful. Indeed it is strange that no animal can be induced to stay in that house, not even a cat. Rats and mice are never found in it. The instincts of the brute creation detect influences deadly to their existence. Man's reason has a sense less subtle, because it has a resisting power more supreme. But enough, do you comprehend my theory? Yes, though imperfectly, and I accept any crotchet, pardon the word, however odd, rather than embrace at once the notion of ghosts and hobgoblins we imbibed in our nurseries. Still, to my unfortunate house the evil is the same. What on earth can I do with the house? I will tell you what I would do. 
I am convinced from my own internal feelings that the small unfurnished room at right angles to the door of the bedroom which I occupied, forms a starting point or receptacle for the influences which haunt the house, and I strongly advise you to have the walls open, the floor removed, nay, the whole room pulled down. I observe that it is detached from the body of the house, built over the small backyard, and could be removed without injury to the rest of the building. And you think, if I did that, you would cut off the telegraph wires. Try it. I am so persuaded that I am right, that I will pay half the expense if you will allow me to direct the operations. Nay, I am well able to afford the cost, for the rest, allow me to write to you. About ten days afterwards I received a letter from Mr. J, telling me that he had visited the house since I had seen him, that he had found the two letters I had described replaced in the drawer from which I had taken them, that he had read them with misgivings like my own, that he had instituted a cautious inquiry about the woman to whom I rightly conjectured they had been written. It seemed that thirty-six years ago, a year before the date of the letters, she had married, against the wish of her relations, an American of very suspicious character, in fact, he was generally believed to have been a pirate. She herself was the daughter of very respectable tradespeople, and had served in the capacity of nursery governess before her marriage. She had a brother, a widower, who was considered wealthy, and who had one child of about six years old. A month after the marriage, the body of this brother was found in the Thames, near London Bridge, there seemed some marks of violence about his throat, but they were not deemed sufficient to warrant the inquest in any other verdict than that of found drowned. The American and his wife took charge of the little boy, the deceased brother having by his will left his sister the guardian of his only child, and in the event of the child's death, the sister inherited. The child died about six months afterwards, it was supposed to have been neglected and ill-treated. The neighbors deposed to have heard it shriek at night. The surgeon who had examined it after death said that it was emaciated as if from want of nourishment, and the body was covered with livid bruises. It seemed that one winter night the child had sought to escape, crept out into the backyard, tried to scale the wall, fallen back exhausted, and been found at morning on the stones in a dying state. But though there was some evidence of cruelty, there was none of murder, and the aunt and her husband had sought to palliate cruelty by alleging the exceeding stubbornness and perversity of the child, who was declared to be half-witted. Be that as it may, at the orphan's death the aunt inherited her brother's fortune. Before the first wedded year was out the American quitted England abruptly, and never returned to it. He obtained a cruising vessel, which was lost in the Atlantic two years afterwards. The widow was left in affluence, but reverses of various kinds had befallen her, a bank broke, an investment failed, she went into a small business and became insolvent, then she entered into service, sinking lower and lower, from housekeeper down to maid of all work, never long retaining a place, though nothing decided against her character was ever alleged. She was considered sober, honest, and peculiarly quiet in her ways, still nothing prospered with her. And so she had dropped into the workhouse, from which Mr. J, had taken her, to be placed in charge of the very house which she had rented as mistress in the first year of her wedded life. Mr. J, added that he had passed an hour alone in the unfurnished room which I had urged him to destroy, and that his impressions of dread while there were so great, though he had neither heard nor seen anything, that he was eager to have the walls bared and the floors removed as I had suggested. He had engaged persons for the work, and would commence any day I would name. The day was accordingly fixed. I repaired to the haunted house, he went into the blind dreary room, took up the skirting, and then the floors. Under the rafters, covered with rubbish, was found a trap door, quite large enough to admit a man. It was closely nailed down, with clamps and rivets of iron. On removing these we descended into a room below, the existence of which had never been suspected. In this room there had been a window and a flue, but they had been bricked over, evidently for many years. By the help of candles we examined this place, it still retained some mouldering furniture, three chairs, an oak settle, a table, 
all of the fashion of about 80 years ago. There was a chest of drawers against the wall, in which we found, half rotted away, old-fashioned articles of a man's dress, such as might have been worn 80 or a 100 years ago by a gentleman of some rank, costly steel buckles and buttons, like those yet worn in court dresses, a handsome court sword, in a waistcoat which had once been rich with gold lace, but which was now blackened and foul with damp, we found five guineas, a few silver coins, and an ivory ticket, probably for some place of entertainment long since passed away. But our main discovery was in a kind of iron safe fixed to the wall, the lock of which it cost us much trouble to get picked. In this safe were three shelves, and two small drawers. Ranged on the shelves were several small bottles of crystal, hermetically stopped. They contained colorless volatile essences, of the nature of which I shall only say that they were not poisons, phosphor and ammonia entered into some of them. There were also some very curious glass tubes, and a small pointed rod of iron, with a large lump of rock crystal, and another of amber, also a lodestone of great power. In one of the drawers we found a miniature portrait set in gold, and retaining the freshness of its colors most remarkably, considering the length of time it had probably been there. The portrait was that of a man who might be somewhat advanced in middle life, perhaps 47 or 48. It was a remarkable face, a most impressive face. If you could fancy some mighty serpent transformed into a man, preserving in the human lineaments the old serpent type, you would have a better idea of that countenance than long descriptions can convey, the width and flatness of frontal, the tapering elegance of contour disguising the strength of the deadly jaw, the long, large, terrible eye, glittering and green as the emerald, and with all a certain ruthless calm, as if from the consciousness of an immense power. Mechanically I turned round the miniature to examine the back of it, and on the back was engraved a pentacle, in the middle of the pentacle a ladder, and the third step of the ladder was formed by the date 1765. Examining still more minutely, I detected a spring, this, on being pressed, opened the back of the miniature as a lid. With inside the lid were engraved, Mariana to thee, be faithful in life and in death to. Here follows a name that I will not mention, but it was not unfamiliar to me. I had heard it spoken of by old men in my childhood as the name borne by a dazzling charlatan who had made a great sensation in London for a year or so, and had fled the country on the charge of a double murder within his own house, that of his mistress and his rival. I said nothing of this to Mr. J., to whom reluctantly I resigned the miniature. We had found no difficulty in opening the first drawer within the iron safe, we found great difficulty in opening the second, it was not locked, but it resisted all efforts, till we inserted in the clinks the edge of a chisel. When we had thus drawn it forth we found a very singular apparatus in the nicest order. Upon a small thin book, or rather tablet, was placed a saucer of crystal, this saucer was filled with a clear liquid, on that liquid floated a kind of compass, with a needle shifting rapidly round, but instead of the usual points of a compass were seven strange characters, not very unlike those used by astrologers to denote the planets. A peculiar, but not strong nor displeasing odor came from this drawer, which was lined with a wood that we afterwards discovered to be hazel. Whatever the cause of this odor, it produced a material effect on the nerves. We all felt it, even the two workmen who were in the room, a creeping tingling sensation from the tips of the fingers to the roots of the hair. Impatient to examine the tablet, I removed the saucer. As I did so the needle of the compass went round and round with exceeding swiftness, and I felt a shock that ran through my whole frame, so that I dropped the saucer on the floor. The liquid was spilt, the saucer was broken, the compass rolled to the end of the room, and at that instant the walls shook to and fro, as if a giant had swayed and rocked them. The two workmen were so frightened that they ran up the ladder by which we had descended from the trapdoor, but seeing that nothing more happened, they were easily induced to return. Meanwhile I had opened the tablet, it was bound in plain red leather, with a silver clasp, it contained but one sheet of thick vellum, and on that sheet were inscribed within a double pentacle, words in old monkish Latin, 
which are literally to be translated thus, on all that it can reach within these walls, sentient or inanimate, living or dead, as moves the needle, so work my will. Accursed be the house, and restless be the dwellers therein. We found no more. Mr. J. burnt the tablet and its anathema. He raised to the foundations the part of the building containing the secret room with the chamber over it. He had then the courage to inhabit the house himself for a month, and a quieter, better conditioned house could not be found in all London. Subsequently he led it to advantage, and his tenant has made no complaints.